go ahead and get started and then folks can, you know, um, keep joining us as we go along. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Mascaram gabrek zaber Assistant Clinical Professor and Director of Inclusion and Community Engagement in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change here at Arizona State University. I feel um, incredibly privileged to be able to provide timely and important programming such as today's lecture and want to thank all of you for joining us. Today, we kick off our third year of um, our colloquium series titled Toward a Liberatory Theory and Praxis with our 13th lecture to date. Uh, this monthly series aims to highlight the work of contemporary scholars belonging to identities and traditions marginalized within mainstream Western academia who, through their work, confront neocolonial power structures and challenge long-standing norms of knowledge production. It was born out of a demand from our graduate students for exposure to more critical scholarship that is relevant to their lived experiences and the times in which we are living. Specifically, I want to thank Tisa Lowen, Alia Hoff, and Drs. Anais Roque and Nalubega Ross, who worked with me to conceptualize this series and to establish its parameters. I also want to thank all of the staff members who have and are helping behind the scenes to make this event happen, uh, Nicole Pomerantz, Alice Casey, and Danny Anderson. I also want to acknowledge CHESC leadership for supporting and sponsoring this series, specifically our unit director, Dr. Chris Dojanowski. Um, before I introduce our wonderful speaker today, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Please note that this presentation and the Q&A session to follow will be recorded or is being recorded. Um, you and the audience will not be visible in the recording and all of the mics will be turned off. Um, as I mentioned, we will be leaving time for questions after the talk and we're asking that you write your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to vocalize the question yourself rather than have me read, read it out, um, please write ask live in parentheses at the end of your question um, that you submit and I will call on you and unmute your mic so that you may do so. All right, so without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gabriela Spears Rico. Dr. Spears Rico is a Pirinda, Terence, and Chicana feminist anthropologist and poet who currently serves as an assistant professor of Chicano Latino studies and American Indian studies at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She authored Decolonial Purepecha Maternalista, Maternalista Motherwork as Pedagogy in the Chicana Motherwork Anthology and in the time of war and hashtags, rehumanizing indigeneity and in the digital landscape and in digi indigenous interfaces, both published in 2019 by the University of Arizona Press. Her research, recent scholarship can be found in transna transnational Chicanx perspectives on Ana Castillo, Pittsburgh University Press 2021, and sparked George Floyd Racism and Progressive Illusion in Minnesota Historical Society Press 2021. Her scholarly work has been featured in Latinx Talk, NDN Collective Stories, Native America Calling, and Indigeneity Rising. The winner of numerous awards, including the Mellon Mays Fellowship and ALCS Fellowship in Native American and Indigenous Studies, and the Woodrow Wilson Career Enhancement Fellowship, her poetry has been published in Sing Poetry from the Indigenous Americas, um, Chiriku Journal, <laughs> Ethnic Studies Review, and Feminist Anthropology. Her creative work has been featured at the De Young Museum, the, Lo the Lost Literary Center, the Minneapolis Institute of the Arts, and the Metropolitan Museum of New York. In 2021, she was one of six winners in the St. Paul Public Art Poetry Contact Contest and was named a McKnight Land Grant Professor by her institution. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gabriela Spears Rico. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go ahead and screen share my lecture here. Kakehevi Kina Pirinda Characu Matlatzingo. Gabriela Arandi Spears Chora Rico. Hello, I introduce myself in my paternal language, Pirinda. I introduce myself by saying, I am Pirinda from Charo, Characu Matlatzingo, in the Matlatzinka language. 
I'm very happy to join you today from Iminishashkadan, Minnesota Makoshe, the place of white sandstone in the land where the waters reflect the clouds on unceded Dakota territory. I come from Michoacán Purepecherio, the land of the fishermen, and I'm from the Pirinda community of Charo Michoacán, the land of net makers. I am also a Purepecha descendant from Uruetaro on my mother's side. My Pirinda grandfather, Pedro Chora, gave me the baptismal name Erandi, meaning sunrise in the Purepecha language. I want to start by saying that it's such an honor to be here today to participate in the Toward a Liberatory Theory and Praxis Colloquium series hosted by ASU School of Human Evolution and Social Change. I want to, to thank Dr. Meski for her logistical labor in bringing this talk together and to everybody um, that she mentioned who was also working behind the scenes. In this talk, as an interdisciplinary Indigenous Latina cult cultural anthropologist who has been working with Indigenous communities in Michoacan for two decades, I hope to give you a sense of how Latinidad has been influenced by and upholds colonial constructs that marginalize Afro-descendants and indigeneity. In order, to, in order to move us towards a liberatory theory and praxis of Latinidad itself, and hopefully one that opens critical conversations in Latino studies and promotes an investment in decolonizing Latinx identities. The title of my talk is Mestizaje and the La Latina Latino Latinx Experience in the United States. Though to, to be transparent, much of what I have to share traces Mestizaje to its Mexican historical origins, since anthropologists are site specific and my field site is Michoacan, Mexico. From the Mexican construction of mestizaje and because anti-Latinx racism is filtered through anti-Mexican racism, I hope we can apply the historical process of the homogenization of identity and the nationalist promotion of mestizaje to Latinidad more generally. The purpose of my lecture then can be summarized as follows. I will start by, um, the, it can be summarized as follows. Um, unpacking and deconstructing Latinidad, understanding key moments that solidified mestizaje as a state construct, gain an understanding of the complexity of Latinx identity in the United States and of the history behind the various labels we use to identify ourselves, understanding why there is a call to critically question Latinidad, and um, and then we'll we'll end by by uh, understanding critical interventions by Afro-Latinx and indigenous people from Abi Ayala into the complexity and shortcomings of Latinidad as a construct. I want to start by discussing a recent event that took place in LA, which boiled over into intergroup conflicts among La La Latinos that are far too recent, but also as old as the concepts of mestizaje and Latinidad themselves. Two weeks ago, an unveiling of a one-year-old taped conversation among three Los Angeles City Council members was released to the public. In it, City Council member Nuri Martinez made hurtful racist jokes targeting African Americans and indigenous people from Oaxaca, from Oaxaca, while two other Latino City Council members snickered and laughed on. More specifically, racist attacks relying on the tropes of unruliness and the stereotypes of black children as misbehaved were hurled against the son of their fellow city council member, Mike Bonin. Additionally, city council representative Nuri Martinez mocked the Los Angeles Oaxacan community as being foreign, unbelonging, dark, short, and physically ugly. Even though the recording took place in October of 2021, but was leaked in October of 2022, it brought up modes of anti-Black and anti-Indigenous violence that have been impacting Black people, Afro-Latinx people, and Indigenous migrants from Latin America at the hands of fellow Latinx people for centuries in both Latin America and the United States. It unveiled centuries of outrage at the discrimination, exclusion, and hurt resultant from this mocking and the stereotypes that influence social policies as they impact Afro-Latinx and indigenous migrant communities in the United States. Last week, the Black community and the Oaxacan community in Los Angeles called for the resignation of Nuri Martinez, Kevin De Leon, and Gil Cedillo, the three Latino city council members involved in the conversation. Since then, Nuri Martinez has resigned after threats of a criminal investigation into the taped conversation 
that also involved discussing power ma mapping and redistricting began. This is just the last public moment which demonstrates that we are facing a critical moment with when the decolonization of Latinx studies is being called for by young people, specifically young artists of African and indigenous descent and by Afro-Latinx and indigenous academics and our allies. The foundational constructs of Latinidad are being questioned in the United States where La Raza Cosmica and Mestizaje are still widely used to identify the Lat Latina Latino Latinx community. The city council members remarks are a reminder that Lat Lat Latinos are not monolithic. We come from various national origins and within those nations, there are diverse ethnic groups and diverse histories impacted by hundreds of years of colonization and racial mixing. Within and through those layers of coloniality, indigenous communities have retained identities, in many cases, territories, languages, and cultures, and Afro-descendant communities throughout Latin America understand the, their historical connections to slavery, displacement, and marriage. Afro-descendant communities in Latin America and Afro-Latinos in the United States are increasingly declaring pride in their Blackness. So what do we do in the midst of this critical turn confronting Latinidad? As I hope to demonstrate today, if Latinidad is to survive, it must encounter this critical moment with openness to embracing its own diversity and willingness to heal old wounds of erasure and exclusion of its most, most marginalized populations. As an ethnic studies scholar today, I hope to demonstrate the complexities of Latinidad and hone in on the fact that Latinidad is not a race. It is an ethnic group, a convenient construct with specific purpose that arose from demands to be counted and included in the United States. I will also begin by unequivocally stating that Latin America is not just mestizaje. Latin America is a result of diverse indigenous nations that preceded European colonization along with more than 500 years of colonialism. Our identities and histories are diverse. To move forward, we must be willing to listen to these critiques unpack mestizaje, embrace diverse identities, work to undo inequalities, and uplift the voices of the folks calling us out and calling us in. And uh, this, this was a graphic that was shared on Twitter um, that was uh, mimicking, you know, what, what happens on the census and how uh, Latinx people get so thrown off by the question of race <laughs> um, when we're asked, uh, you know, first of all, are you um, Hispanic, yes or no? Secondly, you know, what nationality um, do you come from um, or how would you trace your heritage or descent? And then thirdly, what is your race? And then folks get really confused about what to do with this question um, because uh, we've been we've been taught, um, you know, to identify with mestizaje or with racial mixture. And um, and then I like this graphic because it also actually includes the category like let's just cancel Latinidad, let's cancel the whole thing because who is it really serving when we look at the intergroup dynamics and the scenario that I shared with you with you all, which was a real you know in real life story of how. How um, Latinx political leaders themselves sometimes engage in this, these really problematic and racist, anti-Black and anti-Indigenous um, comments and that also are inf influencing their own biases towards the policies that they are creating. So I'm going to be um, covering four moments that for me uplift the construction of Mestizaje as a nationalist project, um, specifically in Mexico. This mural itself though, is a mural um, that's located in Puerto Rico. And it represents sort of like the three faces that are supposed to contribute um, to Mestizaje, indigenous, um, Spanish, white, and African um, influences. So the, the, uh, the four moments that I'm going to be covering are the colonial period and specifically focusing on El Sistema de Castas. Secondly, the Mexican War for Independence. Thirdly, the Mexican Revolution of 1910. And fourthly, the Chicano Movement, which gives us a picture of how these, uh, the, these nationalist myths also get uplifted um, through uh, Mexican-American identity here in the United States. So to begin with um, the Casta paintings um, and the Casta system, this is a lineage um, based uh, tracing um, that's based on the Spanish concept of limpieza de sangre or purity of blood. 
It, it um, allegedly categorized people according to racial mixings that comprise society as well as by socioeconomic status. And so the concept of purity of blood itself is an importation from Spain um, into Latin America um, and into, um, into uh, Mexico or the quote unquote new world. Um, we have to uh, think about the fact that this wasn't the time that um, the Spanish in, uh, encounters with indigenous people and with, um, with African um, people who they um, imported and enslaved um, had not been the first time that they had been categorizing themselves against an other. There had already been um, numerous conflicts um, that the that uh, that Spain was involved in. One of them was um, with uh, folks who were non-Christian, and so purity of blood. One definition is that it it's supposed to represent um, the most pure old Christian blood that a person has, and that's without Jewish ancestors. So um, at this point in time in the um, in colonial Mexico, it, might, it may have been important to distinguish between between social categories during a time when approximately one quarter of the Mexican population was racially mixed and quickly and that number was quickly increasing. These are examples here visually of casta paintings that um, are also said to reproduce the elite gaze because they were they were actually produced and painted by um, colonial uh, the colonial elite. And that demonstrated their own racial anxieties. And so there is a, de a debate in the academy on, you know, how reliable these paintings are to actually show a system of caste. Um, but they do give us an early understanding of the way that folks were thinking about mestizaje, at least in the elite classes. So um, what the what the paintings show us and what the categorization show us is that race in and of itself at this moment in time, um, that there were complex uh, understandings of, of race. The categories numbered around 16 and um, some of them are actually kind of really ridiculous <laughs> um, and uh, demonstrated that the criollo, criollos are the, the um, people of Spanish descent that are um, that are born in uh, in Mexico or in the New World, and the Peninsulares are people of Spanish descent that are coming from Spain. So their populations anxiety, anxiety and hysteria with managing a new racial socioeconomic regime in colonial Mexico. These categories worked alongside a social cultural economic model of classification, and they divided society along numerous bifurcations. One of these bifurcations was the concept of being gente de razón, or people with reason, versus being indigenous, or people who lacked reason, as well as um, attached to that um, gente de razón being folks who lived in the cities or were urban dwellers um, and workers, and folks um, who were plebeians or people who lived in rural areas. Um, and of course, that's another, when you say rural in Mexico, typically it means poor um, mestiza or mestizo, or um, it's also another, you know, sort of racial, unofficial racial marker for indigeneity. Another one of these, um, another one, a way to, to uh, categorize people in the casta system um, was having calidad or the concept of having quality, which took into account various indicators of quality, such as skin color, occupation, wealth, blood, integrity, um, where people were born. And um, it's important to note that mestizo people themselves became associated with a legitimate birth. Um, and they were, there is um, documentation that they were banned from positions of power and prestige. This is sort of the beginning of understanding mestizaje itself as a form of bastardization. Um, and um, it, it does look down upon racial, the system itself does look down upon racial mixing with um, criollos and peninsulares being at the top due to the purity of blood or being of Spanish descent. Um, although, although the archives do also, you know, show um, some complexity in that with um, some folks, you know, who are sort of new arrivals from Spain being in the lower classes in terms of the type of labor that they perform. Um, and it also, um, you know, uh, in, within the system, indigenous people are considered new Christians in, in early colonial Mexico, and they receive a, a certain amount of protection, um, but they're still associated with agriculture and unskilled labor, and they become tribute-paying common people. 
Although there, is, there, there are claims that there could have been fluidity between these categories, for example, because um, Indigenous people were paying tribute, um, they could, you know, um, try to pass as um, mestizo, mestizo people um, to, uh, to not have to pay tribute. So we have to kind of um, also think about how do we give these categories themselves um, and the Castas agency, um, and is there fluidity within the system for people to move between them? So, and you know, but it's uh, it's um, without a doubt, the these paintings that, like I mentioned before, are being produced by the um, colonial elite um, at this moment do demonstrate um, racialization. And they specifically give messaging about um, the, uh, um, the perceived inferiority of blackness and of indigeneity, um, such as, you know, this painting here at the bottom that, that is called Indios Barbaros, um, that actually, you know, um, translates into barbaric indigenous people or people who refuse to assimilate or, you know, engage in any sort of like contact with, um, <clears throat> with colonial Mexican society and sort of like still lived in their traditional territories, et cetera, could be considered in that category of Indios Barbaros, um, as well as the fact of, if we look at how even the gendered dynamics, how black women in these paintings are um, depicted as being, um, you know, um, aggressive or um, unruly, um, you know, um, engaging in, a, in, a, in, in aggressive acts against their husbands, we can kind of also see how this, um, this conceptualization of indigenous and black inferiority is also being communicated um, through the paintings. The second moment that I want to examine is the Mexican War of Independence, another moment that um, for me also concretizes mestizaje as a nationalist contra construct in Mexico. Um, at this point in time, Mexico had been under 300, year, 300 years of colonial rule um, by Spain. The economic system of mercantilism had um, had depleted Mexican resources and relied on a, on a model of extractivism where um, Mexico was being mined of its resources to pay off Spanish debts and to enrich in the colonizing entity. Um, there was also an hacienda system um, that um, really relied on the exploitation of labor of um, indigenous folks and of poor um, mestiza people. Um, and at the same time, you know, there is, there's just all of this, uh, anger uh, broiling over um, in Mexico from, you know, folks who are sort of in the lower classes, um, mestiza people and um, indigenous people, um, Afro descendants as well, and are tired of sort of like, you know, getting ruled over by mainland, um, by mainland Spain, who also banned with um, angry criollos, um, the people of Spanish descent, um, who are born in, um, in, uh, in Mexico, and um, start this, you know, this uh, war for independence. What's key here is that um, when the, in 1810, the El Grito de Dolores is, um, is, uh, is shouted in Dolores Guanajuato, the figure who is at the forefront of that is Father Miguel Hidalgo. And as you can see, um, Father Miguel Hidalgo is a very light-skinned um, mestizo. And um, he sort of becomes representative, the image of him becomes representative of the entire movement, even though the army was at least 50% indigenous and also had a large contingent of Afro-Mexican folks from La Costa Chica specifically. So um, it is successful in 1821, Spanish rule ends in Mexico. It, this, this is a moment when Mexican nationalism gets a rebirth and Mexican patriotism itself as well. And um, Miguel Hidalgo is often um, depicted um, and is understood to have been carrying this banner of the Virgin of Guadalupe, who is very representative of the new mestiza, mestizo, um, Mexico, um, also as, um, as nationalism, because um, she's known as sort of like the mother of conversion who, come, who brings about the, the harmonious um, end to the, um, to the violence of the Spanish um, invasion or the Spanish conquest. Um, and what's key too to how this concretizes mestiza is how we often don't learn about the influential roles of Afro-Mexican revolutionaries like Jose Maria Morelos, for example, Juan Alvarez or Vicente Guerrero, who went on to become the president of Mexico and abolish slavery in 1829. So the Afro-descendant, um, you know, revolutionary leaders who we owe a great debt to as Mexicans are um, really like erased um, in the narrative as is the, um, the uh, you know, large participation by indigenous people in the fight as well. 
So before I talk about the third moment, which is the Mexican Revolution of 1910, I want to give a little bit of context as to um, what leads up to it. And it's this, um, this period of um, the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz or Porfiriato. In the pre-revolution pre era, he was very, very influential, his attitudes and his policy. He was vehemently anti-Indigenous. Um, he denied, you know, he was a mestizo who denied his own indigenous heritage. Um, he called himself Latin. Uh, he had, you know, great uh, relations with um, with French leaders, and also, um, and was, you know, sort of like trying to be kin also with with France and that, and that um, calling himself Latin, and also powdered his skin in, in an effort to also lighten it. And uh, his policies themselves were um, were good in a sense because there was they were building infrastructure um, in Mexico um, after uh, the uh, the War of Independence. Mexico was still lacking infrastructure after 300 years of colonialism. He really invested in public projects, um, and it was um, a uh, a time of economic prosperity under the Porfiriato, but it also um, it also created a huge wealth gap um, under his uh, his dictatorship or presidency. So one of the things that he did was that he had a campaign of privatization um, in Mexico, which is sort of like early neoliberalism. He implement, implemented what was called the Latifundo land ownership structure. This granted land titles to, of huge acreage to a very elite few, um, including opening Mexico up for rich foreigners. And this forced poor people off the, you know, recently privatized um, land, yes, by force as well, by removal sometimes. Um, so by the time that 1910 came about, only 2% of the population held um, titles to land, and only 10% of indigenous communities um, um, were owning land at that time. So in uh, 1910, this is, you know, the, the Porfiriato is also boiling over into um, anger among, um, among uh, poor mestizos and also um, indigenous people. And this um, revolutionary movement begins in the north with Pancho Villa and in the south with Emiliano Zapata. Um, they kind of, you know, become like the, myth, the mythic historical heroes of the Mexican Revolution, although it was a, a large um, a large movement with many people involved, including women, by the way, um, Soldaderas Adelitas. Um, and, uh, and it is, you know, successful in that, um, that they do, uh, they do institutionalize a, a Mexican um, democracy or a form of Mexican democracy, which becomes El PRI. And we can talk about whether, you know, El PRI eventually becomes its own. Um, El Partido um, Revolucionario Institucional, the um, revolutionary institutional um, party becomes kind of its own form of um of dictatorship <laughs> as it stays in, in power for so long. But at this moment in time, with the idealism of the revolution, um, it, it does succeed in, um, in democratizing um, specifically land ownership through the implementation of the ejido system, um, which provides land to um, landless um, poor folks, landless um, mestizo people, as well as um, as well as re, uh, repatriates land to um, indigenous communities as well. Um, and during this period of time, when um, when there when a, when a war happens right after the um, the revolution ends, as in any country, there has to be a period of reconstruction. And in that period of reconstruction, typically, um, it's it's a call for um, nationalizing and for unifying the nation again. Um, with this, what happens and the way that this concretizes Mestizaje further as, an, as a nationalist identity construct is that there is a campaign to um, modernize Mexico, um, to um, implement um, influences of Western values um, and Western models as much as possible. And so that also means for political leaders um, bringing indigenous people you know, um, into the future or to modernize them as well, which means that there's an assimilationist campaign that's implemented to destroy indigenous languages and indigenous cultures um, in order to bring indigenous people forward and to Mexicanize them for their own sake. One key figure in this is Jose Vasconcelos, who authors um, La Raza Cosmica um, in, uh, in 1925. And Vasconcelos' uh, main idea is that La Raza Cosmica, like the mestiza, mestizo race, is actually the ideal race because it takes, um, it takes, uh, it's very, you know, sort of eugenicist. It takes, uh, um, 
attributions and influences um, genetically from, um, from all the different races and brings it together into one ideal race. However, if you read even the introduction of, um, of La Raza Cosmica, you start getting a sense of uh, Vasconcelos' own racism and that he attributes um, the uh, intellectual contributions to Spanish descent um, or to the white European ancestry of Mexicans and um, physical, you know, being able to sustain physical labor um, and rith rhythm, you know, contributions, physical rhythm contributions to um, African descent and to indigenous descent. So already we're seeing how, you know, this may not be as ideal as, um, as he's proclaiming um, if we really analyze, you know, what he's saying in, um, in, La, in La Raza Cosmica. Um, what happens is that he becomes an, a very influential uh, political um, politician in terms of ideology, and he um, is uh, mandated to work together with uh, with a, a man named Manuel Gamio, and together they um, they they implement the uh, the um, assimilationist campaign that specifically targets indigenous communities. Mestizaje as a state project gains further ground in this period of reconstruction in, in Mexico. So certain things are implemented, implemented. for example, in Mexican um, K through 12 education, Tenochtitlan, um, the, the um, um, city of the, um, the founding of Mexico um, through the uh, Aztec empire is considered the official, official origin story, even though Mexico has, you know, 64 indigenous groups with various or origin stories and creation stories um, that, you know, could be like speaking to each other in a concert um, of diversity, this, um, you know, this it sort of becomes what well, everybody comes from this one particular, you know, um, one particular orange story of the, uh, the encounter between the Aztecs and the Spanish. There is an adoption of Span the Spanish language as the national language. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a push to assimilate into Western values um, and Hispanic influences um, and to um, elevate um, mat material manifestations of Western culture. And um, and this is also a moment, this is my own analysis as a feminist, is that this also becomes a moment that rearticulates um, the violent rape um, that took place in the sexual violence that took place in the Spanish conquest as this um, har harmonious encounter that births Misty Sahib, because none of that is dealt with or discussed. Um, and um, what, you know, just from like my work as an anthropologist and as somebody who teaches Latino studies, I can tell you that Misty Sahib actually be, continues to become, to be a wound among Latinx people rather than a celebration, but in this um, effort to uh, for it to become a nationalist myth for, um, you know, for Mexican national identity, it is a celebration. This happens also um, within popular culture where um, Los Tres Grandes, um, who are, you know, the three um, muralists, uh, Orozco Siqueiros and uh, Diego Rivera, are commissioned to create these um, beautiful murals um, in the national buildings, the national government buildings. Um, if we analyze these murals themselves in visual culture, like this one called The Great Tenochtitlan by Diego Rivera, it actually shows a chronology of Mexico itself where indigenous people are purely depicted as being um, past, as being, you know, in the past um, and not as contemporary indigenous, um, indigenous communities. So according to scholars, Natividad Gutierrez and um, Guillermo Bonfil Batalla, um, this post-revolution nation building project of mestizaje succeeds in racializing indigenous people as impediments to progress and in promoting ethnocide. Uh, and uh, Natividad Gutierrez um, in, in his book, uh, Nationalist Myths and Ethnic, uh, Ethnic Identities, calls this the great contra contradiction of Mexican identity, which I think we're still, we're still um, you know, under, which is that um, the indigenous uh, cultures and indigenous contributions of the past are glorified and celebrated, while contemporary indigenous people are not recognized, or if they are, it's through these, um, if we are, it's through these stereotypes of sort of like being dirty, ignorant, poor, um, you know, um, not smart and, um, and, and powerless. This is a quote from Natividad Gutierrez's book. The dead Indian people are the source of authenticity and originality embedded in an exceptional historical past. The living indigenous people in contrast bear witness to an enduring pervasive social marginalization, thus contradiction, contradicting the nationalist agenda 
of modernity. One example, you know, that happens every year where this is still officially observed in Mexico is El Dia de la Raza on October 12th, or the day that the race was born. This is this is coming, um, I looked into like the history of El Dia de la Raza in Mexico. The first one was held in 1929, and it was influenced by um, Jose Vasconcelos' ideas. Um, this is, you know, um, this uh, idea of la raza or the birth of the race relies on the myth that history begins with Christopher Columbus. Um, today, um, because of the Chicano movement, which will be the last event that I'll cover here, um, people still use la raza to identify Latinx people. And la raza has different meanings in Mexico. I grew up in a pueblo and I do know that it's also used to kind of, um, you know, identify like just working class Mexicans, um, you know, ourselves as like the people, the real people of Mexico. It's also, it was also actually a political party, La Raza Unida, here um, in the United States, and it's been used as a rallying cry um, for to gain political power among, among the working class. But today it's also, um, you know, seen as exclusionary because it is, um, you know, seen as Mexican-centric and also elevates um, mestizaje. So now moving on to, to um, you know, a portrait of like today's U.S. Latino population. Um, these are uh, snippets of research in the last um, 10 years um, from the Pew Hispanic Center and the U.S. Census on what, what the Latinx population looks like um, today. And then I have a couple of handouts that I'm going to be sending um, to, uh, to Dr. Meski that I hope that, you know, hopefully she can share with everybody um, who attended this session. Uh, one of them is um, a handout on Latinx statistics um, that I want to share with everybody um, that show how Latinos um, are racial and um and treated you know as a, as a group um and suffer inequality as a result um that um that I want to share with everybody to kind of make some of the points that I have today what these um, particular um, graphs of the, the Latino population in the US show us is that um, the Latino population is growing. Um, recent trends show that its growth is due, due, more, to, uh, due more to US births rather than um, new arrivals or immigrants, which is an interesting trend. Um, that um, it's approximately about 55.4 million people of those um, Mexicans and Mexican Americans make up about 65%, followed by um, um, Puerto Ricans um, who, uh, who also make up about 10% of, of the population. So the point that I want to make here is that the um, that many of these um, conceptualizations of mestizaje are imported into our identities in the United States. And th this is proof, this is all from the Pew Hispanic, the Pew Research Center. Um, and it shows, you know, how um, Lat Lat Latinx people on the census um, are more likely to check off some other race because of, you know, of um, they're not sure, you know, like being a, of um, identifying with um, mix with racial mixture. Um, they don't uh, identify the race only as white, black, or Asian, and um, seven in ten choose um, Hispanic when they're when they're presented with the question of race or ethnicity, and two thirds um, say um, that being Hispanic is actually their race. So there's a lot of confusion, and this is sort of like a graphic that I used to explain it to my students that um, Latinidad is not a race, even though we are racialized in the United States. Um, this is like according to ethnic studies and according to the U.S. Census. Um, Latinidad is broken into nationality, which is like national heritage origins. Uh, secondly, in the census, we're asked, like, what race are we according to, like, are we white, um, Black, Asian, or um, Indigenous? Most people, as I showed before, select mixed race. Um, there, ha there had been so much confusion before that a lot of people were um, were selecting white or being asked to select white, like what happened when the census came to my family when I was a teenager, we were actually just asked to check off white. Um, and, uh, and or you can select, you know, black um, or um, indigenous or Asian. The when people do check off indigenous, it is confusing because then you're asked to check off like, well, what tribe or nation are you? And there is sort of like no recognition of Abi Ayala, Latin American um, indigenous nations and that. Um, 
So, but we are considered an ethnicity um, in the United States. And as an ethnicity, we do get impacted by external racialization, the way that we are treated or viewed um, by, um, by government officials, those in power and, um, and uh, the majority population. Um, we are impacted by linguistic racialization and discrimination. Um, Spanish in and of itself is a very racialized language in the United States. Um, we're impacted um, on, in the uh, handout on, um, on Latinx statistics that I'll share with you. You'll see how um, Latinx people actually make up the majority. The majority of Latinx people work in the service sector kind of jobs as farm workers or in um, the service industry in urban places. Um, we are racialized through, um, you know, being viewed as undocumented um, and or, you know, the word um, illegal, as well as um, impacted by um, intersectionality, um, intersectional aspects of our identities, whether it's how um, gendered, you know, aspects impact the way that um, Latina women are racialized, um, such as the, uh, the stereotype that Latina women um, you know, come to the United States just to give birth to American citizen children, like that kind of over fertile <laughs> stereotype of Latina women or the ever over sexualized stereotype of Latina women also impacts um, racialization. And then um, additionally, um, I would add that there are also intra-group dynamics, um, internal dynamics that we don't deal with that cause um, inequalities between ourselves, such as um, colorism, and um, discrimination against Afro-Latinx people and indigenous um, Latinx people. So just to kind of go and I and a second um, takeaway handout that I'll share with everybody um, will also contain um, much of what I'm about to kind of very quickly go through now, which is um, what are the origins of these different names and labels that um, Latinx people use um, for, for ourselves. So just to kind of give you the cliffs notes here, for um, Latino, Latino, uh, many people don't know this, actually originated in um, the way that the French um, were describing their relationship with folks who spoke the Spanish language vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the um, relationality between the Romance languages. Um, it was actually first um, appeared here in the United States in a California newspaper in 1858. Um, California people, which were the, um, the uh, land-owning elite that um, had titles that preceded Anglo occupation of California um, of Mexican descent, they, um, they used it as La Raza Latina um, in 1858 to identify themselves. But it had been used even earlier than that, um, as early as the 1830s by French economist Michel Chevalier here in the United States to also describe um, to describe people from um, Latin America. So um, the, the attempt was Latino was to draw a relationship between people who spoke the Romance languages, as I said before, um, in order to convince um, Mexicans specifically that um, Mexicans should distance themselves from Spain and see themselves as susceptible to French influence. <clears throat> Hispanic um, is a demographic category that was popularized under Richard Nixon's administration to count the population of Hispanic descent, even though its origins are actually much older than that. Um, the Romans called the Iberian Peninsula Hispania, and that's really like, you know, kind of like the first known um, usage. Um, but Hispano here in the United States was used to describe people who descended from Spanish settlers in the Southwest since the 19th century. <clears throat> So, um, and then this is an example that I was speaking about, you know, directly from, from the, the census. <clears throat> so today, just to kind of summarize the difference between these two terms, Hispanic is understood as people descending from Spain and from Spanish speaking countries. Hispanic is more associated with speaking the Spanish language and it does include um, Spanish people from Spain. Whereas Latino <laughs> is understood to unite people according to Latin American descent who have experienced colonization. So um, that's the difference between the two. And so Latin American and Latino would exclude people who only have Spanish descent. <clears throat> For Ch Chicana and Chicano originates um, through the polit politicization of Mexican-American identity in the 1960s. <clears throat> it came from reclaiming a derogatory term that was used in Texas in the 50s 
or and or other folks say that it, it could have also been a um, variation of the word chilango that's used in Mexico City to describe um, urban um, Mexicans from um, Ciudad de Mexico, or that it could have also been a short inversion of Mexicano. <clears throat> Whatever you know the original origins were, um, it is an identity that was, was, was specifically a political identity associated with the Chicano civil rights movement and one that was meant to be oppositional to um, assimilationist politics that were seen as present in the in the generation before, um, as well as um, oppositional to um, the United States agenda, which which um, has continuously called for the assimilation of of Latinx people. And um, if you've ever seen it with the next, it's sometimes placed at the beginning, and that's um, to recognize the um, indigenous alphabet and indigenous heritage of um, Mexican Americans. Um, and the the Nahuatl language specifically, which is the um, the Aztec or Mexica language, um, uh, uses uh, the X a great deal um, in its alphabet and in its pronunciation. And so, Mexicano, for example, um, that would uh, that word comes from um, the Mexica or Nahuatl, Nahuatl people. Latinx is a newer um, identity or label. And um, this originated in queer Latinx cyberspace in 2004 and gained popularity in 2014. The X in Latinx challenges the gendered nature of the Spanish language by refusing to select the AO, and instead it leaves the possibility for open for Latinidad to be gender neutral or gender nonconforming. Um, it is a term that is gaining ground, and um, it, it's interesting that it also coincides with um, this um, Gen Forward survey that was conducted recently by the University of Chicago, where it indicated that 22% of Latino millennials identify as queer, um, and that's more than any other eth ethnicity among, among millennials. So <clears throat> these are hard questions, and it can be confusing, um, but you know we are not a race, but we are racialized. How, how um, does Latino racialization happen? Um, once again, you know, just trying to, um, to uh, summarize as much as possible, Latinx racialization <clears throat> um, gets filtered a great deal uh, through anti-Mexican anti racism and also through anti-Puerto Rican sentiment since these are two of the earlier groups that the United States as an empire um, dealt with and um, codified. Um, for um, anti-Mexican racism specifically, um, it's viewed um, as wetback labor um, very um, early on with that, you know, derogatory term of wetback because people are seen as like having just crossed the Rio Grande um, to, um, to come work in the United States. Um, and um, that like that that label is is very racialized because um, Mexicans are being paid less um, for comparable jobs, regardless of skill or experience. Um, <clears throat> And both Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, regardless of where they lived, are are tracked into service into service jobs um, because of the colonial relationship between um, the newly uh, gained Mexican territory, the U.S. Southwest, and also Puerto Rico um, as a as a commonwealth. Um, <clears throat> since the mid 20th, 20th century, Mexicans are also perceived as migrant, um, and their labor is supposed to be temporary. Um, it's supposed to, you know, the, the assumption here is that it's okay to hire them because they're going to be returning back um, to their homeland, which already shows us this attitude of rejection for Mexican presence, Mexican migrant presence in the United States. There's also this, uh, as I mentioned before, this perception of the hyper fertility of Mexican women, that the idea that, um, you know, pregnant Mexican women are only coming or crossing the border just to give birth to US citizens, as well as um, the codifying of Mexican labor and Mexican people as quote unquote illegal. Um, and this, you know, always um, sort of reinforces the US Mexico border as the place where we emerge from or belong as, you know, as, um, as threats um, that are coming into the United States to, to like take US jobs or people who don't um, belong here or bring criminality. And it parallels like this socially constructed paranoia uh, around protecting US territorial integrity. <clears throat> Excuse me. The US-Mexico um, war is import an important moment here to also understand um, historically. I'm not gonna get too much into the details except you know, to recognize that the conflict emerges, emerges over um, 
you know, a debate about where the southern border dot lies. Does it lie in the Nueces River, as is shown here on the map, or does it lie at the Rio Grande? And that ends up um, costing Mexico um, half of its national territory. Um, there is um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that's passed to um, protect um, the rights of Mexican and new, newly um, recognized Mexican Americans. Um, that are annexed along with the ter territory into the United States to protect property rights, um, to protect citizenship and voting rights. However, those decisions are really made at the local level um, and um, the local um, governments are ran by Anglo um, arri arrivals um, who don't respect um, Mexican um, rights or Mexican American rights. What's important to note here are that there are these racializing um, these racializing attitudes that impact the US-Mexico war itself and leading up to the, the US-Mexico war. One of these um, racializing um, attitudes is tied to just people who have Spanish heritage in general. Um, the black legend the, the, that tells us that, you know, Spanish heritage people are greedy, that they're violent, that Spanish colonialism was more violent than British colonialism, which is, you know, a big toss up if we actually study history, um, and that therefore Spanish people are not to be trusted. Um, <clears throat> that uh you know in some cases um the spanish were old foes of english people um that that spaniards opened themselves up to racial mixing in a way that um that british colonialism didn't accept or or you know um didn't um open itself up that way and um, that there are key cultural and lingu linguistic differences such as Prote Protestantism versus Catholicism besides also quote unquote racial differences um between the two. There's also, um, there are also racist attitudes, attitudes towards mestizaje that influenced the US-Mexico war. Um, this is a quote by Stephen Austin, who is um, considered to be the, fa the father of Texas. A war of extermination is raging in Texas. He's talking about the war for um, Texas annexation. A war of barbarism and despotic principles waged by the mongrel Spanish Indian and Negro race against civilization and the Anglo-American race. It's also found not just among politicians, but in, po in popular culture. Walt Whitman, Whitman, a very famous American poet, miserable and efficient Mexico, what has she to do with the great mission of peopling the new world with the noble race, be it ours to achieve this mission. So there were these attitudes specifically um, towards Mexicans uh, because of mestizaje and uh, Mexicans were seen as, you know, not being um, white, definitely um, how, um, how Mexicans were tainted by indigenous blood and therefore could not be trusted with, um, with managing their own land or their own affairs. And of course, blackness, you know, also being part of that made it um, even worse um, in the, uh, the eyes of, uh, of manifest destiny. So there were there were good reasons um, for the Chicano civil rights movement and for the Puerto Rican um, civil rights movement to happen, as um, there were decades of exclusion, of school segregation, of um, you know violence, um, extreme violence in the U.S. Southwest. I recommend this book called *The Injustice Never Leaves, Leaves You* by Monica Munoz Martinez, where she actually historicizes um, with archival proof as a historian um, the amount of lynching that impacted um, Mexican Americans and in um, Texas um, specifically and throughout the Southwest at the hands of groups like the Texas Rangers. Mexicans were lynched um, to, um, uh, to such a high degree that they were the, the second group that was um, most likely to, to be lynched um, second to um, African Americans. Um, <clears throat> I already mentioned about, you know, the localization of, of Mexican American citizenship and how that was really um, under question and under suspicion a great deal because of who was running things after the US-Mexico war. There were also greaser acts that outlawed Mexicans from being in public, um, in public uh, spaces. This 1885 one was in California. Jim Crow also impacted um, Mexicans and um, subjected Mexican American folks to discrimination. And um, in a case um, uh, of a, a family suing um, because of the segregation in the schools and the way that it impacted um, Mexican children in 1946 was a Mendez versus Westminster case. The Chicano movement in and of itself um, had very had different aspects. So it wasn't just like one you know facet. There was a take back the land facet that was demanding material reparations um, for Mexican Americans who had been stripped of their land um, titles after the U.S. Mexico War. 
Um, there was a political party, as I mentioned before, it was called La Raza Unida Party. Um, <clears throat> there was a United Farm Workers Movement um, in education. It was influential in the start of ethnic studies um, with the 1968 East Los Angeles um, high school walkout. So all of these different facets, you know, were working together. However, there was also um, discontent, um, you know, within within the movement itself because of its sexism and um, and its homophobia as well. Um, and uh, there were, uh, you know, early critiques of that. Um, <clears throat> that happened uh, by Chicana feminists uh, specifically, such as um, in the poetry of Lorna de Cervantes and Carmen Tafoya, where they call out Malinchismo, that whenever Chicana women wanted um, to bring up their issues within the Chicano civil rights movement, they were called traitors and told to go join the, um, you know, the um, women's liberation movement. Um, and, uh, and, and there were, you know, interventions that were made by queer Chicana feminists in the 1980s um, that, uh, that were critiquing some of these dynamics of sexism and homophobia in the Chicano civil rights movement. So um, just to kind of analyze also how the Chicano movement itself um, re, uh, reinscribes um, mestizaje as a nationalist cons construct, it does rely on this ma male Aztec centric, um, you know, narrative um, that uh, that appears in m many of the founding documents, like El Plan de Santa Barbara, El Plan Espiritual de Aztlan, um, Aluristas um, uh, poetry, um, this poem called Yo Soy Joaquin by um, Corky Gonzalez as well. Um, indigenous I, indigenous um, identity is essentialized in this, but it's um, it reproduces like Mexica representations, cultural representations as being the dominant ones, um, and it, it does you know also uh, fall into the trap of glorifying um, the indigenous contributions of the past, uh, while sort of like not dealing with contemporary indigenous communities in, in Mexico and the diversity that there is among among them. <clears throat> And so even with these trailblazing critiques that we get from amazing and brilliant scholars like um, Chicana feminists, queer Chicana feminists, Gloria and Saldua, um, even there, this is reproduced in the reliance of La Raza and Mestizaje um, and, uh, and, you know, a sort of uh, not, uh, not um, rec recognizing contemporary indigenous communities or, um, in or including contemporary indigenous communities in the conversation. Um, and in um, her book, Borderlands, Gloria Saldua also reinscribes mestizaje and Mexica centrism, um, as well as being central to, um, to Chicanismo or Chicanisma, um, as well as, uh, um, you know, does so through like the theories that, that, um, that she develops, some of them which are, you know, really wonderful um, theories like the Cuatlicua State, the Goyoshaki Principle, um, mestiza consciousness, but again, you know, going into um, concretizing mestizaje and la raza as the identities that are that are the ones that you know that um, that we should call, we should call upon to think about ourselves as um, Chicanx or Latinx people. Um, so just to end here, um, you know, what are the shortcomings of Latinidad and what are they teaching us? Um, this is a picture of um, the uh, now former LA City Council representative Nuri Martinez here, as well as a graphic um, that's um, that's um, looking into studies in Mexico itself um, by Oxfam um, that is looking at how um, skin color impacts the um, the uh, experiences of, of darker skin Mexicans and the kind of inequalities that darker skin Mexicans um, face. Um, we don't have a similar study as of yet among U.S. Um, Latinx people, but I thought it was, you know, an interesting um, thing to consider um, that, you know, Mexico itself is sort of contending with the same questions. So, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the shortcomings of, of Latinidad are that it, there, it's impossible to sort of capture us all with one label or with one identity. Um, because of racial mixture, but also because mestizaje has been constructed as the identity that we should all go by. Uh, mestizaje itself, um, you know, marginalizes communities and it leaves out people from the conversation. It doesn't deal with colorism or with inequalities. Um, there is still a great deal of anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism, as I, sh you know, shared with that recent example that just was outed at two weeks ago. Um, inequality in our intergroup dynamics. Um, and representational Latinx politics that definitely do not represent us all. And to end here, 
Um, I want to share, you know, critical interventions that are coming about by, um, by two groups of people. The first one um, is the Critical Latinx Indigeneities Working Group, which I'm a part of. Um, these are some of the main, um, you know, some of the main interventions that um, that collectively we're bringing to the table, rejecting um, the call to assimilate into a Latinidad as Indigenous people, insisting that it's okay for us to um, claim our nations and um, pride in who we are um, in our communities and to not have to like, you know, blend into Latinidad in the U.S. model. Um, it questions mestizaje as a colonial construct that manifests privileges and executes erasure of indigenous nations. It engages with the mestizo search for identity as mourning. Um, and, um, and, you know, in my work, um, my book, Mestizo Melancholia, <clears throat> I am um, I'm doing precisely that by working with um, Mexican tourists who tour indigenous communities and thinking through these questions of identity um, and um, and the politics of, um, of of cultural commodification and solidarity in, in Mexico. Um, the critical Latinx indigeneities working group also calls out anti-indigenous racism among, among Latinx people. For example, the way that racism manifests itself in schooling, um, how um, some of these super racist um, terms like Oaxaquita um, are still used in schooling to target and um, make fun of and exclude um, indigenous um, Mexicans um, by other Latinx people themselves. And um, it recognizes intersectionality. So um, we do have, you know, um, feminist um, academics in our in our midst who are thinking through how, um, you know, migration is gendered, how violence is gendered, how neoliberalism itself is gendered. And uh, and then uh, this uh, model of multiple colonialities is super useful to thinking specifically about um, the experiences of indigenous migrants in the United States. Um, it says that indigenous migrants don't shed um, don't shed their indigeneity when we cross the U.S.-Mexico border because the conditions that inform our migration and how we navigate the U.S. Um, landscape are informed by the colonial forces that were working to erase and displace us uh, in the first place and why we may have been um, forced to uh, leave our home countries. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it, it interrogates the colonial forces that force folks to migrate. And um, it uh, it recognizes how and how indigenous migrants experience anti um, Latinx racism in the U.S. getting grouped, you know, with other um, Latinx people, um, but at the same time experience anti indigenous racism within Latinidad. So there's a layer there of, of um, coloniality and racism that's experiencing as well as um, how to navigate indigeneity itself, like linguistic racism, not having access to interpreters um, of indigenous languages um, when, you know, when folks um, of, uh, with, when indigenous uh, Mexicans or Guatemalans, et cetera, um, have to face um, formal proceedings in the United States um, and that uh, multiple colonialities also recognizes, this is a, a concept by May Lee Blackwell that recognizes also gender and class and intersectionality. And uh, finally, to think about um, the Afro-Latinx um, experience, how anti-Latinx racism um, and um, anti-Blackness um, operate, um, and sometimes, you know, the similarities that are not discussed in these experiences and how they converge um, specifically in the Afro-Latinx experience. Um, well, there is a regulation of racialized labor that impacts both um, black, folks, black, black folks and Latinx people. Um, folks are tracked into specific labor forces, Mexican or Latinx people. Um, for example, um, you know, coming from farm worker um, families uh, uh, are actually historicized as like replacing um, slave um, labor in the U.S. fields. Um, and, and today, migrant farm workers continue being vulnerable, exploited, and racialized um, labor force. Um, there's also the regulation or detention of bodies that we can think about as, you know, um, similar experiences um, in within the prison system, the prison industrial complex, and in immigration detention centers as well. Um, where um, racialized bodies are also producing goods as unpaid labor for corporations. Um, the experience of surveillance or having to be surveilled um, from, you know, being surveilled in, um, in segregated um, communities, urban communities, um, as well as, um, you know, by, by, uh, by police forces. Um, we saw that come, come, come full force here in Minneapolis um, two summers ago with the police killing of George Floyd um, to the way that ICE and Homeland Security also surveils 
um, the presumed criminality of folks in community, um, specifically um, of uh, Black and Brown men, um, and police um, uh, sub sub susceptibility to police violence, the policing of wombs as well. This hyperfertility um, stereotype is applied not just to Latina women in the way that I discussed, but also to Black women. And like I said, all of this converges in the Afro-Latinx experience. Some of the Afro-Latinx interventions that we're seeing um, and that we're contending with um, in uh, Latinidad and in Latinx studies um, is um, to have an understanding that race within Latinidad matters. Um, that Afro-Latinx people cannot escape Blackness and that we have to deal with that. We have to deal with anti-Blackness in the Latinx community, um, that um, Black Lives Matter, um, but that something like holding up a sign that says Latinx for Black Lives um, actually engages in the erasure of Afro-Latinx people who are part of our communities. And I really recommend the work of the Black Latinas No Collective because um, they're asking us to think about many of these issues critically and from perspectives of intersectional feminism. So um, that's the end of my, of my talk. Um, I apologize for my own technical difficulties with it. I, know, I don't know what, what exactly I had um, that uh, really irritated um, my throat, um, but thank you for hanging in there with me. Um, and uh, I leave you with this picture of my daughter in our um, home community in Michoacan, where I'm actually going back to tomorrow. So I'm really excited about that. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'm sharing my contact information in case folks you know, want to um, follow up with me. Um, and I am you know, looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much for that um, super informative sort of crash course um, lecture. I There's so much information there and I'm really glad that um, you said you'll be sharing some um, handouts and we can send it out to all of our folks who are SVP as well. Um, if you wanna take a, a, a moment, uh, get a drink, uh, <laughs> you can do that. And I want to open up the floor for our participants, our attendees to please send and any questions that you might have for Dr. Spears Rico um, in the, as I mentioned, in the Q&A tab. Um, and we will um, start sort of that conversation, get it going. In the, in the, in the um, Q and A section, we'll just wait a moment for Dr. Spirico to come. <clears throat> Okay, so we have a question from one of our graduate students, Lisa, um, Frida. She says, thank you for this comprehensive presentation. So many good reminders as I embrace decolonial feminism at the theoretical framework for my doctoral work. I was very interested in the final diagram of multiple colonialities. Can you point me towards more sources which elaborate on this? Yes, specifically the work of Maylee Blackwell. Um, and I can write, um, Dr. Blackwell's name in the chat. Um, uh, May Lee, Dr. Blackwell has numerous publications, all of which I recommend. And um, uh, she is actually an American Indian uh, Cherokee um, scholar. And, um, and she's been working though um, with uh, Mexican indigenous communities um, in Mexico and in the United States for about three decades now. And uh, her work is um, specifically on um, Mexican indigenous feminism. Um, she started working with um, women in the EZLN and the um, um, Ejército Zapatista para la Liberación Nacional shortly after um, the movement emerged. And, um, and then also has been, you know, interviewing and working with um, indigenous uh, women activists um, from Oaxaca that are involved with the, um, with the FIOB, Frente Indígena para um, uh, Binacional, Binacional, Binational um, Indigenous Organization of um, Oaxacan um, community members and activists. And, um, and, and she's been working specifically with um, the women leaders um, in that, um, <clears throat> that binational org 
And uh, that this is where she gathers, you know, um, to think through multiple colonialities because of the experiences of indigenous migrants um, are, um, are different than what would be the experiences of Latinx, you know, um, Latinx of people who don't identify as indigenous or don't come from indigenous communities um, specifically. Um, so yeah, so that framework, um, you know, is um, is very relevant um, because it gets to some, through some of it gets to some of those that um, indigenous people have been, you know, trying to name uh, the um, layered invisibility um, that um, that indigenous um, people um, experience, and uh, what do we do with experiences of discrimination, um, such as like the ones my sister um, is, you know, like two or three shades darker than me, and and she used to be called Hershey's um, at school, and she used to be called, you know, um, some of those like really racist, infantilizing. Um, 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 stereotypes that are applied to indigenous to indigenous people by other um, Latinx um, students, and and I know you know how that trauma you know manifests itself um, well into into um, adulthood um, from you know from colleagues um, um, experiences as well in, in within the um, critical Latinx indigeneities um, working group. So yes, um, there um, this the I'll send I can send you if you send me an email I can send you the the specific citation for multiple colonialities. It's from one of um, Dr. Blackwell's um, articles um, where she really elaborates on it, but really um, in, um, in um, all of her work, um, she's, she published this article maybe about 10 years ago and I still find it very useful um, in work um, that's followed up, followed up since then. She continues to rely on, a, on, you know, on the concept to think through um, the layered experiences of um, coloniality that indigenous migrants have to contend with. Thank you. Um, we have another question that says, can you expound on the term Latinx? For example, how can how do you suggest we explain it to our elders who seemingly react poorly to the change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, uh, it is definitely an intergenerational conversation and, and an intergenerational debate right now. Um, it is also seen, it's being viewed also as a North American imposition um, because of its origin in the United States. Um, the other uh, the other response is that we already have a gender neutral term, which I I've been using, you know, in this in this um, conversation, which is Lat Latin A with an E at the end, um, as well as like I was also saying Misty's Misty's A um, with an E at the end. Um, but you know, I think that um, <clears throat> the way that I'm talking to people who have resistance to it is that I myself, you know, my position as a as a college professor, I respect how my students identify themselves and their autonomy to identify themselves um, how they choose to. And what I've seen with my queer students is that it's really important to recognize um, the complexity that the X brings um, at the end. And some of my students who also identify um, as indigenous or of indigenous descent also see it as a reclaiming of the X, as I was talking about, you know, how it happens in Chicanx identity with the with um, the X also um, being a reference to um, indigeneity. Um, and I also think that, you know, it's calling for us to decolonize as well, like that movement um, started with um, queer, um, <clears throat> queer um, Lat Lat Latin A people, um, as I was mentioning in cyberspace in the early 2000s. Um, if it's coming from the community, I think that we can afford it that respect um, to consider it, you know, an identity that folks want for themselves. Um, it doesn't mean that it like, you know, erases or is calling into question folks who identify as Latino or Latina. As you heard me today, I, I use them, you know, sometimes inter interchangeably or I use them all at once. Um, and I also think that um, it is, for me, it's also a decolonial move because um, we had gender variants in the Americas. Um, in Mesoamerica as well, more than, you know, more than two genders. Um, some societies had four or five genders. And um, for me, the term Latinx, it actually reminds me of that. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a good reminder for me to also decolonize in the way that I think about, about gender and the multiplicities of gender, um, and to think about the experience of gender nonconforming folks, trans folks, um, two spirit, um, and, uh, and gender queer people. So, um, so I also see it as a dec decolonial move. And I, you know, I try to have these conversations and explain all this also um, to, um, to my parents, um, you know, as they're also contending with it. And they're like, I didn't know that I was Latinx. Like, what does that mean? You know, so <laughs> um, it's, you know, uh, baby steps, but I think that, um, that it's, it's a good, it's a good conversation to have specifically because it opens 
um, uh, possibilities to talk about queerness and gender. And as I mentioned, now that we know that um, a large percentage of, Latin, of Latin, Latino, Latino, Latinx millennials identify as queer, it's a great time to think about this and talk about it. Um, I I hadn't heard, uh, it makes sense obviously now as you're talking about it, but the, uh, the, the X as a reference to sort of the indigenous identity as well, um, sort of that added layer. Um, I think it's, it's pretty cool. Um, okay, so as folks, please send in questions um, while people do that. I had a question that I wanted to ask. You mentioned it in one of your late slides, and I know that you're working on a book on this. So I, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about, um, I think on the slide you had it, mestizo, the mestizo surge for identity as mourning, um, mm -hmm. and sort of talk to us a little bit about that concept of what what you mean by that and um again i know you're writing a whole book on it but sort of like if you could give us a little yes, story. well i should start thinking about it because i'm going into the field tomorrow <laughs> but um <laughs> but yes um i you know i i'm I, i'm theorizing melancholia um among um mestiza mestizo mestisex people and it, it for me it goes back to what i was talking about earlier which is that this elevation of mestizaje and concretizing of mestizaje as a nationalist construct and identity um, was so celebratory that it didn't allow folks to deal with the wound of it. Um, and, you know, what I'm seeing in my interviews with tourists and their desires to be in Indigenous communities and learn from Indigenous communities, um, they're, they're, they're wanting um, to explore indigeneity, um, sometimes in really problematic ways, but also for, for, for some folks, it's also, you know, because of that wound where they're just like, you know, I'm um, detribalized. I didn't grow up, you know, with these traditions. I didn't grow up in a community. I just, you you know, I'm here to learn. I want to be respectful. Um, you know, I want to know how to be in solidarity. Um, and, uh, you know, but I don't know how to, how to do so. Right. And so, um, so it's, uh, I think, uh, that um, for me, that longing um, is uh, is a melancholia um, in the Freudian sense. It is about searching for something that's missing, um, and it's searching for a way to heal from uh, from the wounding. Um, and I'm I'm also um, relying on Chicana feminist scholars like Evan Torres, who write about trauma and about intergenerational trauma um, among um, mestiza mestizo people, um, and uh, and thinking through you know um, like I, my uh, I want to end my book by thinking through how do we make it productive and how do we make it an, um, you know, an accomplice um, alliance um, that stands by indigenous struggles, because that's, that's what, that's what's missing in my conversations with tourists, um, is that when I ask about, you know, um, well, what, are, you know, what do you think about what's going on right now um, with, um, I work in a complex Omitracan with the drug cartels right now, it's a hard place to navigate. Um, for, you know, for folks from various backgrounds, including folks who visit the state just for tourism. And, um, and so often they don't know anything, you know, about um, Indigenous communities, and it's not their fault. But once you know, you know, what do you do with, um, what are the next steps? And, um, and, you know, and if, if folks are, I think if folks are genuinely wanting to, you know, reconnect and understand, it also means understanding Indigenous folks as contemporary people and, um, and thinking through like, what are, you know, the political priorities of Indigenous communities today? Um, how do we, you know, um, make those visible and, um, and, and make those heard um, and, um, and stand by folks in, in a way that's meaningful? Rather than just sort of being here for the for the so-called folklore as it's as it's curated by the Mexican Secretary of Tourism, so that's how I'm thinking about about melan melancholia. Um, in uh, in other work such as the work of um, the brilliant um, Josie Saldana, um, which I recommend, her book is called Indian Given. Um, she's um, thinking about it also as um, how is it a move to innocence, you know, when when it's like your indigeneity is given because it's part of mestizaje. Um, so you can just go ahead and, and you know, take it and, and you know, and, and say that that's that that's who you are um, without sort of um, thinking through the dynamics of power, which in my field work are very, very apparent. Um, just in like, you know, who's being toured, <laughs> who has access to leisure, um, you know, in the mestizo um, uh, middle class in, in Mexico, um, who has access to leisure and who has to deal with all the tourists and the devastation that comes through the tourism. Um, and that, you know, power dynamic in and of itself is saying something about um, Mexican, um, you know, um, identity and, and Mexican um, 
uh, relations and um, and uh, what the economic system and the current uh, collusion between the Mexican government and drug, and drug, cart drug cartels are doing um, to marginalize indigenous folks as well as the neoliberal um, system and relations with you know with free trade in, in North America, et cetera. All of that are working to displace um, indigenous communities specifically. The fact that that marginality is is not part of the conversations and the desires to tour um, is also for me um, important to um, to question. And in Salda and Saldaya Negrete's book, um, she talks about you know how problematic it is to kind of just take the Indian given um, with uh, you know as a move to innocence um, in the in the racial project that was the U.S. Southwest and Mexico without um, without um, questioning. Um, the power and the privilege um, of being able to just do that. So that's um, that's where our work is is going with thinking through melancholia and power. Lovely. Uh, I look forward to to reading the book. Um, do we have any more questions from our audience? Um, I'm trying to see if there's a question in there. Okay. So this is a, a sort of a second question from from Frida. Um, the scholarship is so necessary as a formerly undocumented light-skinned uh, Mexicana from Jalisco. I find that decolonial literature within the U.S. based is rich in the American Indian perspective, but even native feminisms are difficult for me to embody or implement as a theoretical framework, leaving me to combine Latin American decolonial feminism, feminisms, Lugones, and Chicana feminisms, Anzaldua which also I find have their own complexities. Thoughts? Yes. <clears throat> All of that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes, so I recommend also reading the work that's being put out by the working group um, and the work of Afro Latinas. Like I said, just check out the Black Latinas No, no Collective. Um, you know, also for um, for further critical work, and um, some of them are also academic, so you can actually see, you know, what they're writing and what they're publishing as well. Right. Um, do we have any more questions? We have time probably for one more question, if we have any. All right we can wrap up. Thank you again so much for that super informative and important presentation, Dr. Spirzico. Um, we were very lucky to have you. Um, and I want to thank all of the folks who participated, who came today um, for coming as well. Uh, just a reminder, we have another talk coming up next month on November 30th. And our speakers for that day are going to be Dr. Um, Savannah Shange and um, one of her community collaborators, Stephanie Hopkins. And so I hope to see you all then as well. Um, again, thank you everyone for coming and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>